Okay, all right, great. Okay, then uh, I will start. Uh, welcome to our last uh, session today. This conference uh, went very quickly and I uh, just want to say it was organized just impeccably perfectly. It's uh, too bad that it couldn't happen in person, it would have been uh, really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, today is uh, uh, Bloom's Day, the 16th of uh, June for literary. You know, we had our Joyce presentation yesterday, but yeah, I was thinking about that. But okay, so we have our last uh, two, last but not least, two speakers. And uh, I guess I will introduce you one at a time before each presentation. The first is uh, Matthew Schneider. He's a uh, Chair and Professor of uh, English at High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. Um, he, a founding member of the first Generative Anthropology Seminar with Eric Gantz at UCLA in 1987. Schneider has continued his involvement with GA for more than 20 years, contributing six articles to Anthropoetics guest authoring two chronicles of love and resentment and publishing an essay in Adam Katz's uh, The uh, Original Hypothesis Collection. He has published two books, uh, uh, the latest uh, of which The Long and um, Winding Road uh, from uh, Blake to the uh, Beatles came out from Palgrave uh, Macmillan uh, in June 2008. His article uh, on uh, 19th century British literature, uh, literary theory and uh, biblical exegesis has appeared in uh, Dollhouse uh, Review, European Romantic Review, Poetics Today, Legal Studies Forum and Symbiosis. And I must uh, also of course mention that Matthew was uh, the host of two uh, GAS conferences. Uh, the latest was in 2015 and the first, I think in 2003. Okay, so one was, okay, uh, Ian, then one was before, before my time. Uh, and I don't remember, I don't know when it was, but the two that I remember, it was in 2015 and uh, uh, 2000, 10, I think, is that correct? Or yeah, so, but 2008 in Orange County. Yes, yes, and that one, that was uh, right. right. So I apologize. So three conferences. That's okay. So that's a kind of a record. Okay, and uh, now I will uh, let Matthew speak. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Yes, the first one was in 2008, which I think was only the second uh, uh, GA summer conference. The first one was in 07 in in um, Vancouver, or in, yes, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So I want to do something I've never done before. I want to dedicate my paper this afternoon to our late GASC colleague, Edmund Wright, who at the 2015 GA conference here in High Point earned my admiration and astonishment when he recited Wordsworth's Intimations Ode entirely from memory. I thought that was a, a yes. wonderful testimony to his <laughs> wonderful testimony to to uh, Edmund as as a an interpreter of Wordsworth, but also just a lover of Wordsworth. And I hope that my paper today will help to dissipate some of the uh, disdain with which Wordsworth and other canonical poets are viewed by um, large swaths of contemporary academia. So here goes Marlene Norbese Philip is a, a Caribbean born Canadian novelist, poet ess and essayist, essayist whose coming of age novel Harriet's Daughter has been a mainstay of Canadian high school English courses since its publication in 1988. In a 2017 interview, Philip identified the central image that sums up English literature studies in the Caribbean as the daffodil explaining that as a child in Trinidad, she and her fellow students had to engage with Wordsworth's daffodils at some time 
although we had never seen them. And I forgot to uh, share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint, hang on. All right. <clears throat> um, although we had never seen them. This was an injustice, said Philip, because it was as if our very futures depended on being able to write about these bloody flowers instead of the flora and fauna of her native land. Voicing the common multicultural complaint that colonial education neglects students to see ourselves reflected back to us, Philip proffered a corrective to what she saw as the unearned centrality of Wordsworth's celebrated flower. Quote, a daffodil is not a hibiscus, poinsettia, croton, or flamboyant. Now, I first heard about this condemnation of the daffodil at a romanticism conference in 2019 when a presenter um, approvingly referenced it in, in a presentation about Wordsworth, as it turned out. At the time, I took it as an expression of the recently ascendant trend in academia to decolonize the curriculum, an imperative observable from kindergartens to doctoral programs across Western Europe and North America. An afternoon's research, however, showed me that Caribbean writers' resentment of Wordsworth's most famous lyric goes back at least half a century and is widespread enough to have even launched a critical concept in post-colonial literary studies the daffodil gap. In the words of Helen Tiffin, the daffodil gap is the difference between the lived colonial or post-colonial post -colonial experience and the imported imposed world of the Anglo written. In fact, there's scarcely a writer from the tropical regions of the Commonwealth who does not invoke the daffodil as the emblem of oppressive colonial miseducation. I don't like daffodils, says a Jamaican boy in Jean Rhys, The Day They Burned the Books. And the narrator silently assents, remarking, I was also tired of learning and reciting poems in praise of daffodils. A pretty little flower, no doubt, but we had never seen it, wrote V.S. Naipaul in 1973. Caribbean novelists of the 1980s and 90s, like Michelle Cliff and Edwidge, Edwidge Dantica, echoed Reese and Paul's, not Paul's complaint. In Cliff's Abeng, a schoolmaster requires his students to memorize the daffodils poem of Mr. Wordsworth, spoken with as little accent as possible here as elsewhere, the use of pigeon is to be severely discouraged. As a result, the narrator muses across the empire on which the sun never set, probably there were a million children who could recite daffodils and a million who had never seen the flower, and so did not know why the poet had been, so, had been stunned. Dantica's eyes, breath, memory, despite its Haitian setting, mentions daffodils in the very first sentence. The most extensive, though, and, and angriest treatment of the daffodil gap in these multicultural cla classics is in Jamaica Kincaid's Lucy, an autobiographical coming of age novel as beloved in American high school English classes as Harriet's daughter is in Canadian. Lucy narrates the journey of its eponymous heroine from a dysfunctional relationship with her Trinidadian mother to New York where she is hired as an au pair by wealthy Manhattanites, Mariah and Lewis. Arriving in January, Lucy is discomfited by the winter cold she has never experienced but Mariah excitedly tells her that in spring, she'll see daffodils pushing their way up out of the ground. And when they're in bloom and all massed together, a breeze comes along and makes them do a curtsy to the lawn stretching out in front of them. Have you ever seen that? When I see that, I feel so glad to be alive. And I thought, so Mariah is made to feel alive in the breeze. How does a person get to be that way? Of course, Lucy has never seen daffodils, but as a result of her colonial education, she has heard of them. As a 10-year-old pupil at Queen Victoria Girls School, Lucy had been forced to memorize an old poem, which she then recited to an auditorium full of parents, teachers, and my fellow pupils. 
After I was done, everyone stood up and applauded with an enthusiasm that surprised me. And later they told me how nicely I had pronounced every word, how I had placed just the right amount of special emphasis in places where that was needed and how proud the poet now long dead would have been to hear his words ringing out of my mouth. These congratulations leave Lucy cold, however. Instead, she attributes to this experience her first awareness of what we're, the readers are invited to see as the colonizer's obliteration of her true self. I was then at the height of my two-facedness, that is, outside false, inside true. And so I made pleasant little noises that showed both modesty and appreciation. But inside, I was making a vow to erase from my mind, line by line, every word of that poem. The night after I had recited the poem, I dreamt continuously, it seemed, that I was being chased down a, net, down a narrow cobbled street by bunches and bunches of those same daffodils that I had vowed to forget. And when I finally fell down from exhaustion, they all piled on top of me until I was buried deep underneath them and was never seen again. I had forgotten all this until Mariah mentioned daffodils, and now I told it to her with such an amount of anger, I surprised both of us. Later, Mariah brings Lucy to a field of daffodils, hoping that seeing the flowers in person will help the younger woman forget her anger. So she sees this field of daffodils, and initially she allows that they look beautiful and simple, as if, to make, as if made to erase a complicated and unnecessary idea. But almost as uh, quickly, however, her, and, uh, her rage returns. I did not know what these flowers were. And so it was a mystery to me why I wanted to kill them. I wished that I had an enormous scythe. I would just walk down the path, dragging it alongside me, and I would cut these flowers down at the place where they emerged from the ground. Now, scholars of post-colonial studies have, as you might expect, eagerly interpreted Lucy's dream and her unacted wish to decapitate the daffodils as the return of the colonized repressed, the understandable rage of a colonial subject impelled to admire a distant and unseen master. In her act of repeating the words of the English poet laureate, William Wordsworth, Lucy exhibits the false consciousness that is the hallmark of the colonized, writes Kristen Mollis. For Alison Donnell, Lucy's retrospective vision of reciting Wordsworth's poem works as both a literal example of colonial education and as a metonym for the colonial apparatus promotion of an aesthetic which is ideologically motivated in its very essence of seeming to be devoid of ideology. <clears throat> Have to take a big breath after that one. The poetic subject, daffodils, signifies the forced adoption of the motherland and the attendant suppression of difference. To Ian Smith, Lucy's examination of Wordsworth's exportation to the tropics registers a concomitant exportation of desire so powerful that it requires self-invalidation and obfuscation of native West Indian traditions. Kincaid's trauma of being forced to memorize a poem about daffodils where none were to be found in the place I grew up could be seen as the origin of what we might call anti-colonial aesthetics in which the standard of beauty is directly proportional to the contempt one expresses for the cherished treasures of the master culture. And it's with this familiar mimetic double bind that we return to Marlene Norbese Philip and her vituperation of Wordsworth's bloody flowers. Like Kincaid's Lucy and millions of other Commonwealth school children around the world, Philip proudly carries her ad into adulthood, her childhood resentment of having to learn about something she had never seen. Now, identifying herself as a language poet who has come deeply to distrust the ability of, quote, any European language to truly speak our truths without the language in question being put through some sort of decontaminating process, Philip avenges Wordsworth's domination of her literary education by dismembering the daffodil, riffing on the image to turn out something like this. 
is not a daffodil is and not is? What Philip and the other Caribbean writers really want is for their school days to have been structured along the lines of what is today called a culturally inclusive education or a decolonized curriculum. In a 2020 interview, Philip complained that as a schoolgirl, she was forced to study the European flowers mentioned in the works of Shakespeare and Wordsworth, rather than say the Trinidadian Pui trees that bloomed with yellow flowers every March and April, and the blossoms drip, dropped, and there was this carpet of gold across which I remember walking so many mornings to school. You know, it was like somebody had just thrown this carpet out for me, but we had nothing about that, you know. We had to learn about wandering daffodils and things like that. We need to see ourselves reflected back to us as a colonial, and a colonial education did not see us. Now, please like this for relevant or inclusive curricula represent the orthodox view in today's schools of education and undergird movements like uh, hashtag disrupt texts, which has been getting appearing in the news rather frequently lately. Disrupt texts is a crowdsourced grassroots effort by teachers for teachers to challenge the traditional canon in order to create a more inclusive, representative, and equitable language arts curriculum that our students deserve. Hashtag disrupt texts. I think you do say the hashtag. Is that correct? That, I think that's right. Hashtag disrupt texts encourages teachers to jettison irrelevant classics like the Odyssey and Moby Dick but is also even attacked to kill a mockingbird for lionizing the ineffectual white savior, Atticus Finch, and William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies, for featuring only elite, upper-class, white, cisgender European males. Now, daffodils are uh, native to North Africa, and they're usually yellow or, uh, yellow or gold, although there are some varieties that that are white and um, don't have any gender because they're plants. So why all the hate? And is Wordsworth's poem really even about daffodils? Well, reading the poem through the lens of GA, I think, suggests that viewing it as the resentful Caribbeans do, as having forced them to admire a flower they've never seen is actually a misapprehension of the poem. Now, the lyrics only four standards, stanzas is well known, but I think it's short enough to be read in its entirety. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of the bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. The poem identifies its real subject in its very first word, I. And it puts the peripatetic poet in a recurrent Wordsworthian situation, walking numbly through the countryside in a state of perturbed self-absorption, lonely as a cloud. The daffodils interrupt this reverie presenting themselves not just as an arrestingly beautiful natural objects, but as numerous and therefore the antithesis of the speaker's solipsism. They are a host, a crowd engaged in a sprightly dance that is in coordinated harmonious motion. This glimpse scene taken in all at once and um, therefore as a kind of structure into uh, unto itself, taken in all at once, therefore juxtaposes the single with the many, offering the poet an opportunity to rejoin a community from which he has been self-excluded. 
The enduring value of this glance, however, leads to the expression of, a, of another common Wordsworthian trope, the concept of prospective memory rendered perhaps most famously in his poem, Tintern Abbey, and now with gleams of half extinguished thought with many recognitions dim and faint and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. So I, I didn't, I, this maybe needs a little bit of explanation. I was probably pretty straightforward, especially to the English professors, but this is a really a, a powerful component of Wordsworth's theory of mind that one of the most valuable things about uh, these natural scenes, which are just, which are not just celebrated for Wordsworth for their own sake, but for the way that they transform his, uh, his thinking, is this kind of discovery of, of the future. And this discovery or this awareness that he will in the future remember the scene that he's seeing now adds a, a, a bolus of pleasure to the scene as it's being perceived, but also reassures him that there is some kind of continuity between the past, the present, and the future, which is also a big Wordsworthian preoccupation. So the wealth that he will take from the sight of this never ending line of daffodils stretched along the margin of the bay arises from the unique ability of memory to assure the vacant and pensive poet of his membership in a community. And that community is constituted by that unique human capacity for consciousness. And that's why this prospective, prospective memory is such an important part of it. Now it's useful in this context to note what I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud doesn't do. The poem doesn't provide a payon to the beauty of Narcissus pseudo Narcissus nor really much in the way of description of the flowers at all. Only one adjective is applied to the daffodils and golden, and it merely specifies their color. I suppose it could be argued that in order to imagine the flowers dancing, it's necessary to know that daffodils, unlike the flowering bushes and, and trees that uh, tr are typical of the tropics, daffodils grow directly out of the ground and therefore are particularly apt to move in unison when stirred by the wind. <clears throat> but surely someone raised in the tropics would have seen other grassy plants moved by the wind as if in unison, or as there's another image that Wordsworth, Wordsworth provides, the sparkling waves. Poem also refers to stars in the night sky, which as far as I know are visible in the West Indies. <clears throat> so, if you say that this is a this vision of uh, daffodils is something that's uh, that's geographically or culturally isolated or bound, exclusive, I don't think um, that the, that that's necessarily the case because there are alternatives that the poem provides for other ways to to glimpse this kind of uh, coordinated motion of something outside the self. So again, why so much anger at these bloody flowers? Well, we've been talking all day today about resentment. <laughs> uh, probably in our own way, we've been talking about resentment through the whole conference and all the way back to the very first of these GA conferences. And we hardly need reminding that resentment is highly contagious. An anti-colonialist aesthetics of resentment, therefore, has a great deal of mimetic energy to propel it forward. Like all but like all mimetic phenomena, resentment succeeds at nothing so well as generating oppositional resentment. So how receptive am I going to be to hashtag disrupt texts aim to center black indigenous and voices of color in literature if the first thing you tell me is how much you hate Wordsworth? Okay. So you hate Wordsworth, Marlene Norbasi Phillip and, Jama and Jamaica Kincaid. And not only that, you detest daffodils, fine. Well, I hate your garish hibiscus flowers, your poisonous poinsettias, and your voraciously colonizing bougainvilleas, which ruined the stucco on my house in Los Angeles. If, <laughs> The emergence of this anti-colonialist aesthetics of resentment 
paints a, a grim future for, the fu for uh, literary criticism and education. It seems to say that in the future, what we're going to do is instead of reasonably argue about our differing tastes or offer aesthetic discernments of increasing sophistication, what we're gonna do is just trample on each other's flower beds. Well, if that's the case, thanks, but no thanks. And by the way, Marlene and Jamaica, the poem that you find so traumatic isn't even about daffodils. It's about the benefits that accrue both to the individual and to the society and to society by the recognition, which is enabled in many cases through canonical authors like William Wordsworth, of our participation in a community that stretches far beyond our immediate circumstances and the things that we already know. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, and I will unshare. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And I think I would like to go to the uh, next speaker and then we will have uh, questions to both speakers. So the last speaker of uh, our conference is our host, uh, Roman Katzman. Um, uh, he is a, a professor in the Department of Literature of the Jewish People at Bar Ilan University, the author of books and articles on literary theory and Hebrew and Russian literatures, as well as on Russian Jewish intellectual heritage. And one of them, uh, you know, uh, Adam Kass reminded us of uh, uh, literature uh, history choice. Um, and in recent years, much attention in Roman's research has been paid to Russian language Israeli literature. And uh, he's published three books on this subject. His presentation focuses on uh, the GA reading in uh, one of the Russian Israeli authors. And uh, I forgot, I am sorry to give the title of Matthew's uh, presentation, but I will, uh, let me see, <laughs> I'm struggling here with my screen. Uh, um, uh, no, I lost, sorry, I lost okay. that. Uh, yeah, if you can uh, these, give the these title. Bloody, and... Yeah, these bloody flowers, the aesthetics uh, of resentment in multicultural literature. Yes, thank you. And Roman, since I have lost the screen now somehow with the name, can you please uh, give the title of your paper and uh, proceed? Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And uh, I'll, I'll start with the paper. It's about Alexander Lubinsky and it's about the cross lines. Uh, all right, then. Um, I'll start and it's uh, Alexander Lubinsky is one of the most interesting and least known writers in Russian Israeli literature. He was born in 1949 in Moscow and repatriated to Israel in 1989. He began his active publication on novels, short stories, poetry and essays about literature um, and culture in the 90s. Uh, Lubinsky is the author of the novels Forbidden Zone uh, from 2005 and Wine Yards of the Night from 2011. The principle of uh, Lubinsky's literary and historical thinking is embodied in the title of his collection of stories and essays at the Cross Lines from 2007, on the cover of which is depicted a map of Heinrich Bunting from uh, 1581 that presents a world in the form of a three leaf clover with Jerusalem at its center. And uh, um, I'll share a screen to show you this. Mm. No. So never mind. And uh, also um, in his essays at the cross lines of times and at the cross lines of history and drama. This is a principle of cross lines. The first part of the book at the cross lines is called Visiting the Levant. 
and an annotation characterizes it as, quote, prose born of the immortal culture of the Levant. Here on the streets, uh, end quote, here on the streets of Jerusalem, you can meet the heroes of Joyce. In Jaffa, the heroes of ancient myth. On a bench in Tel Aviv, you can have a chat with Philo of Alexandria about the nature of things and with Jacques Derrida about the nature of words. Lubinsky was given the Russian prize in 2010 for the novel Wine Yards of the Night. The narrator writes a spy novel about the struggle for influence that develops between various political powers in the land of Israel in the first post-war years of the eve on the proclamation of the states. The various special and temporal layers, the pages of the novel being written by him, as well as his commentaries in the process of writing, overlay each other in such a way, quote, as if there is no time, or rather all times are one, end quote. And as though the narrator is an eternal Jew, being born anew and wandering over countries and ages. In addition to historical topics, the author often returns to the question of Russian-Israeli literature and conducts a dialogue with his fellow writers, alive and dead. Uh, quote, I'm continuing our dialogue from the pages of my book as he's conducting his from the pages of his book. And I'm carrying on our common cause. Thus, out of the combination of fates reflected in the words is our current and contrived literature formed, grasping onto this wrung out, dry, wounded land with the roots of the recalcitrant fig tree." End quote. This reflection on Russian-Israeli literature refers to one of Lubinsky's lyrical essays from an apocryphon, which is included in the collection The Cross Lights. In it, the author attempts to understand the duality of his Russian-Israeli existence in a native foreign land by returning to the originary scene of Abraham's sacrifice and its interpretation, as well as to the comparison of it to the Christian idea. In another essay, Along the Roads of Dreams, Lubinsky develops his thinking by turning to the image of Jacob and to the thought of Philo of Alexandria about the sources of knowledge and meaning in the connection to the dichotomy of why I other. Leaving the second essay for the separate analysis, I will here look at the first essay with the goal of explaining both the content of the ideas presented in it, as well as the method of thought itself, and Lubinsky's self-reflection. Jumping ahead, I will say that this method demonstrates its effectiveness by being interpreted as an originary analysis of culture creation proposed by Eric Gans. An interpretation of this vein makes it possible to discover the anthropological content of this existential and cultural political concern. This, quote, nostalgia for a foreign land, in the words of the other Russian Israeli writer, Mikhail Yutsen, in which the author and many of his countrymen abide. The essay from an apocryphon begins with an abbreviated citation, citation from Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard, which I always cite here uh, in full. Uh, open quote. Through the urging of his face, Abraham left the land of his forefathers and became a stranger in the land of promise. He left one thing behind it and took one thing alone. He left his worldly wisdom behind and took with him faith. For as he would not have left the land of his fathers, but would have thought in an unreasonable demand. Though his face he came to be this, uh, through his face, he came to be a stranger in the land of promise, where there was nothing to remind him of all that had been dear to him but where everything by its newness tempted his soul to longing." End quote. Lubinsky reminds us that these words in turn refer to the letter to the Hebrews by the Apostle Paul, quote from Hebrews. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, end quote. 
The narrator of Lubinsky exclaims in disbelief, quote, what a strange thought. If the land is promised, and can one be a foreigner in this land? And is it possible for the land of your promise to remain foreign, for it to be in spite of the seeming closeness, as inaccessible as before, end quote. The author's bewilderment is also elicited by the fact that Paul is speaking to the Jews, quote, who had lived in Palestine for more than thousands of years on their own land, experiencing the bitterness and sweetness of life in their own state, end quote. I suppose that the disbelief here is nothing more than a rhetorical device and is attributed to the narrator, the made up author of this essay, Apocryphon, since Lubinsky could not have been surprised by Paul's goal, all the more so since it is stated in the following verses of the letter to the Hebrews. Quote, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. End quote from Apostle Paul. That is to say, Paul, to justify the God in his loyalty to his people, replaces the earthly homeland with the heavenly, after which any land becomes foreign, any person becomes a foreigner, and any promise becomes a deferral of appropriation. And this alienation or deferral is presented by him and after him by Kierkegaard as a result of faith. The author responds to the apostle challenge with the parable of the fig tree that brings the wanderer back to his land. Quote, a fig tree stands by the side of the road and the desert wind fans its bent, tired trunk. Its fruit can be sweet, but it can also be bitter. It, li it lives for many years, its roots embedded in this rocky soil, and it is just as unmerciful to ask why are you living in the world if you are filled with bitterness, as it is to take an only son away from his father? Is not the bitter fig tree just as much God's creation? And is it its life only in serving? End quote. In other words, he wants to ask, is its life only in being sacrificed, in serving as an instrument? The tree is tied symbolically with the fire wood for Isaac's sacrifice with the Abraham Isaac pair itself, as well as with a cross. And thereby the author takes a victim out of the zone of silence and passive suffering. Along with the tree also given a chance to speak is the source that gives life to the tree, the earth, the archetype of silent matter or the, of the eternal feminine. Further in they say, it is developed into the parable of the mother abandoned by her son in the name of faith. In this myth, the tree turns from an instrument into a person, and what seemed imagined, the meaning of the tree's existence on earth, becomes real. Under the term real, in this instance, should be understood the reconstruction of the scene of the generative conflict the attributes of which are the deferral of violence and a mutual ethical symmetry, equalizing all the participants of the conflict, most bitterly expressed in the words about the fact that the fig tree, quote, is just as much God's creation and that the bitter fig tree is also pleasant to the Lord, end quote. Lubinsky presents his diagnosis to Jews and to Christians. Quote, you who have come to love the eternal more than the transient are wanderers on the roads of the earth. You, like your forefather Abraham, have been given this earth as a promise, and as a promise you require and lose it every second. If not you, no one would have guessed 
that behind the familiar boundary stretches another world. You exist on the border of two worlds. They are as yet not separated within you. They are still battling with each other. There is a firm logic in the history of the European spirit at each of its sharp turns, people were found who turned to the primordium where nothing was yet, but everything was just becoming." End quote. What is being described here is being ascribed to a specific cast of wanderers who nonetheless, according to the author, constitute the salt on the, of the earth. This is nothing other than the conception line at the foundation of original reanalysis, abortion of the gesture of appropriation of the object of desire, leading to the creation of a representation of a sign and the reproduction of the originary scene of culture on which the roles of victims and perpetrators have not yet been designated, where everyone is morally equal in the struggle and everything is still possible. This is a bifurcation point, the singularity, the meaning creating explosion, the leap of faith. More specifically, as results from the whole course of thought in this essay, faith consists precisely in this mythological realization of the sin. It cannot be only heaven or only earth, appropriation or rejection, time or eternity. It is a struggle between them, eternally returning and being returned to the beginning. For that reason, the image of the fig tree as a symbol of this struggle appears once again at the end of the essay. Quote, I am here. I have returned yet again. The evening of judgment day is descending upon Jerusalem. The hills are in the yellow haze, and the city is drowning, swimming, carried away by the molten streams of light. A huge commanding force is pressing all living things to the earth, and the fear of God is clouding their vision. But hearken, a barely audible wind is rustling in the branches of the ancient fig tree and the child is crying behind the wall. The longing for the future is overwhelming him." End quote. With one phrase, a longing for the future, the author is averting the possible incorrect understanding of his return as a romantic one. The barely audible rustle of the wind in the branches of the ancient fig tree is a symbolic expression of the awareness that can be called neo-indigenous, or in other words, self-engendering, in need, the beginning, the source, the birth, or the earth is realized in the here being as an originary scene of the creation of culture, the semantic vector of which is directed into the future and not into the past. What can be called following Lubinsky, Abraham's conflict or the paradox of the foreigner in his own land does not harmonize, but on the contrary, it staged in you precisely so that it can become the source for understanding and forming a new side, knowledge and ethics. The new indigeneity of the foreigner, his cultural identity derives from this sin and is not assigned a priori as a socio-political given. It is not the source of the conflict, but its consequence, more specifically, the consequence of the abortion in it of the gesture of violence, violence against the fig tree, the son, Isaac, the victim. In answer to the readiness of, to hear their voices, the rustle in the branches and the crying behind the wall, time enters the world. Emmanuel Levinas was close to an understanding of the nature of this process, for example, in his work, Time and the Other, yet his notion of the answer to the summon is inevitable and his notion of the relationship I other as non-symmetrical led him astray. In fact, they led to a conceptual destruction of this scene of culture creation. Reading Lubinsky's essay through the prism of Eric Gunn's generative anthropology allows also want to understand, among other things, how exactly the existential foundation of Russian-Israeli literature is formed. It appears as a, as a cross lines or a cross without a victim, at the scene of a conflict where the aborted gesture of appropriation is turned into the representation of meaning. Such emigre 
or hyphenated literatures as the Russian Israeli are often attributed as an awareness of two roots or a rupture from them or dual belonging or non-belonging, a deterritoriality, a false or adopted identity and memory, liminality, marginality, minority, transnationality, transculturality, and so forth. It is essential to admit in the end that all these theories are made the main, the main thing. In that which concerns consciousness, such concepts as duality, boundary, territory, transition, are only metaphors. None of these exist in reality. Consciousness creates itself every second in absolute unity with itself. Thus, a person writing literature in Russian is a Russian writer and belongs to Russian culture. More accurately, it belongs, this cult, Russian culture belongs to him. At the same time, if he lives in Israel, then he is an Israeli and part of Israeli culture. The former and the latter cannot relate to each other as parts of some third whole and therefore be lacking by themselves. On the contrary, each is whole unto itself. They are in no way in contact and refer to different taxonomies. There is no border between them, nor a crossing over. They are not connected by any trans or I other or mine and others relationship. It is as if they exist in different dimensions and no gesture of appropriation can overcome this. Their simultaneous awareness is possible only in an extremely tense dramatic scenario of the creation of a culture. Moreover, this tenseness is connected not so much with the conflict between the Russian and the Israeli elements. It is only a theme, not the essence, as this Abraham's conflict, noted by Apostle Paul, Kierkegaard, and Lubinsky, between the appropriation or in the language of his epistemologic apprehension of the given promised and its abrogation. Along the contours of this conflict, also this scenario is built of the creation of consciousness itself, which Hermann Cohen called Ursprung, source, and which constantly takes place in the now, having nothing in common with the romantic principle. This self-generation of a new consciousness in the originary source is what neo-indigeneity is. It is impossible to promise or to acquire a new fatherland either on earth or in the heavens. This is simply a contradiction in terms and an absurdity that brings faith to life. However, neither is there necessity in this acquisition or appropriation. According to the original scenario, the abortion of its gesture is what will be the new sign providing the source of a new consciousness and a new language, and consequently of a new literature as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Roman. It's interesting that these two papers got put together because, you know, whoever did it, I guess you did it. It was, I think it was a very good choice because there are some commonalities in, in themes and uh, ideas and, and, and uh, yeah. So I would like to open the floor for questions. Ian, I see. It's Ian, yeah. Hi, thanks. Yeah, uh, I was going to address my question to Matt. Um, uh, I wanted to say, you know, um, if we've, we, you know, Western civilization, Wordsworth and Company have treated the Caribbeans badly, we can't, we seem to have treated the squirrels even worse. And I say that because uh, on our front yard and backyard too, we've got not so much daffodils as tulips and other ornamental flowers. And squirrels come in the night and they just bite the tops off. I mean, it's like siding them down. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's, it's an under-examined phenomenon of rodent resentment. Anyway, I'll, I'll try not to be too silly. Uh, but I did want to ask a more serious question because um, if I take my own rhetoric seriously from my talk first thing this morning, 
I mean, resentment is, at least in the political process, but maybe in the educational one too, resentment is something that you can't just sort of stop doing it, you know, say, tell them, stop doing it. But how are you going to do? I mean, how do you process this? What do you, how do you work with it? So I guess my question is, you know, how would you teach then? I mean, we've got a bunch of teachers here, right? What would you teach? How would you teach it? Especially in a situation, and I don't know what your student demographics are like at High Point U, but in a situation where the demographics are changing, you know, and, and uh, the, you know, you've got different students in front of you and so forth with different kinds of experiences. Do you give any ground here or how do you do it? I mean, just to say myself, you know, I'm in a luckier position, maybe you are too in a way that I, I have to teach or my main subject to teach is romantic literature. So, you know, I don't have to teach Caribbean literature and, and so forth. But again, I'm also being required, to, as I think many of us are, to teach other things too and, and to broader, you know, audiences and, and so forth than just uh, undergrad upper level courses in romanticism or something. So how, do you have any thoughts about how you address the, this, the situation, at least in a pedagogical context that you described? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, obviously uh, I exaggerated uh, my response to, to try to highlight what I think is the off-putting amount of resentment coming out of these these novels, but I did read the novels. I read Lucy and um, and um, Ah Bang, and you know they're for what they are. They're great. They're they're good novels. They're interesting. They're a lot alike, <laughs> but they're they're very interesting. And I can see how you would you would want to you would want to include something like that. I, I have to say, though, I utterly reject and would reject, and even in the teaching situation, the implicit idea that, that what you read has to have a, a, dis, you know, a, a direct connection to your, to your own lived experience. That was not the case for me in reading about romantic, in reading romantic literature of, uh, of the England a country I wasn't born in uh, two centuries ago. So why, why has that become the standard by which we have to make decisions about what we teach and then focus on what, what it is that we talk about when we do teach those things? I think for me, the GA is a great, uh, a great corrective to this because it assumes a, 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 a human commonality despite differences in custom time language and so on and allows you to go go directly to that and say and to acknowledge that there are differences but at the same time to say well the more interesting question than those differences is because the differences are superficial and obvious the more interesting thing and deeper thing to consider is what what draws us together what what do we have in common uh, that would seem to be the thing that's on the surface, but it actually isn't. So that's what I'd say is just um, don't take the bait. I think they're I think they are baiting us in the first place. So don't take the bait. And then secondly, he, you know, hew to the unique insight that this way of thinking gives us, which is a concentration not on on difference, but on on um, what, Similarity, I guess. I mean, not not even that. Just common origin, right? Yeah, but you, I, I agree. I'm not, not going to say anything more. But just I agree. And you gave a little bit of a demonstration, really, of how one could do that when you interpreted uh, the words with poem. And I guess that's what one does. It one acknowledges the difference from the students' experience and so forth, and one's own and whatever. But then one teaches to that kind of universality. Maybe. Yeah, I'll shut up now. Maybe. Okay, do we have uh, I see Mandalena? Yes, if, if you don't mind. Um, I have a question to Matthew. Um, Matthew, don't you think so that uh, the presence of resentment in the literature is related somehow uh, with the, the presence of resentment 
in anthropology as well, because contemporary anthropology takes these subjects as one of the main in the discourse which is produced nowadays. And sometimes I have a feeling that, it, that this is a kind of um, play that we use resentment in the discourse generally uh, preferred nowadays as a kind of tool of rhetoric uh, pressure uh, on people to think in this category. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with this kind of vision. Yes, it, I, I'll take it a step farther. I think it's rhetorical terrorism. You know, uh, you... <laughs> Absolutely. You, you get in a, in a discussion about something like this, and if you refuse to sort of... You can al almost think of it. Girard talks a lot about animal breaking mechanisms and how fatal conflicts between animals are, are, are forestalled by by the one animal, you know, giving up and, yes, and yes. turning and on to its your, back. Your, your, your neck to, to, right. to be cut, yes. That's what, that's what this, this sort of, I hate Wordsworth and I hate daffodils because they were forced on me when I was a kid is a, is a rhetorical tactic that's intended to get me, the lover of Wordsworth, to roll onto my back and expose my neck, yes. right? Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think that that happens not just, you're right. It's, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the anthropological literature as I am, but definitely that's the way things are going. But in anthropological literature, it's growing every day. You know, it's one of the most important subjects which are supported everywhere and all over the world. It doesn't matter if it is in the US and also uh, in Poland uh, and in other countries in Europe as well. Interesting. Okay, I'm happy that we agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, just a very quick, short comment. I mean, no students know what daffodils are any longer, so the problem <laughs> disappears by itself. <laughs> <clears throat> if, if I could insert, uh, aha, okay, uh, Adam, you want to go first? I have a question for Roman also. Uh, okay, I, I, have a, I have a comment for Matthew and a question for Roman and the comment for Matthew is that, you know, I grew up in the grasslands area and I had not seen the forest and as a child, you know, in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, I read the, all the fairy tales were about the forest and all the classic literature was about the forest and uh, I mean, I certainly uh, don't remember any resentment. I just remember how thrilled I was as a teenager when I first got to see the forest and how it was, you know, just connected to uh, this uh, childhood reading. Uh, but uh, I, just, you know, just as a comment, I want to uh, take up, you know, what we could do because sometimes, or I would say often, I despair when I think about this depth of this kind of hatred and I uh, often think this is incurable but you know in terms of what we could do is precisely what you said at the end of your presentation you know teaching the scene and saying okay if you want us to have a dialogue imagine if you start like this how am I going to feel you know that I'm going you are going to stir up hatred in me and anger and so on but you know maybe some people you know they don't want a dialogue but anyway so and then I wanted to ask uh, uh, Roman and you were talking about uh, uh, these and I am not aware of this author I will look him up I know some earlier uh, Russian Israeli authors uh, how what is the place of uh, you know the fact that especially those that were a little bit older that they came to Israel from a society that was largely atheist. And uh, what is that transition like in terms of, you know, this point about reinventing yourself and seeing the empty center, uh, what role, so it's not just coming toward the, uh, 
let's say Jewish identity, but it's coming, you know, like taking religion seriously after uh, being steeped in, uh, uh, you know, like ideology society where uh, religion is just a superstition and uh, nobody basically took it seriously. I don't know if my question makes sense. Yes, uh, sure. You can't say something generalized about this generation or this uh, uh, wave of immigration because uh, so different people from so different backgrounds came here. And there are several movements or several tendencies in the There are people who continued uh, writing in the Soviet manner and in the Soviet uh, ideology. And there are people who changed uh, radically and started uh, looking for religion and uh, seeking for new uh, metaphysics. And there are people who turned to other styles or ideologies or poetics. It, it's a whole world, uh, literary empire, has grown here, so it's so many tendencies. There is no one uh, tendency. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, there is a, there is a, a religious literature too. Lubinsky is not belonging to religious literature, but there are um, several religious writers here in Israel. Religious by by definition. Yeah. To write in religious say, literature. Yeah. I mean, in my experience, and it's been a while since I read any Russian-Israeli authors, but some of the most uh, moving uh, books, meditations on religion, you know, spiritual books that I have read in my entire life, were, and I can't remember, you know, particular names right now, but were written by, uh, you know, these former Soviet Israeli authors that was something that would, uh, you know, uh, make me turn to religion actually and, and uh, think about it seriously as not as, as a superstition. I just find it interesting that there was this transplantation and uh, uh, from... Uh, don't, uh, Marina, don't forget yeah. that in the Soviet Union there were also um, circles where religion played a significant role. So there were the non-conformist circles and there were the samizdat circles. There were the Russian intelligence, intelligentsia circles that were um, very uh, fond of uh, seeking for religious um, ideas or religious sources or, 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 or faith. So it, it's, it, it, not, uh, it must not be that uh, surprising after all. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Adam, I yeah, insert myself before you. Can you please go now? You're, uh, you're muted. Right, sorry. Um, what, um, what role would uh, resentment play? in this neo-indigenous um, position that you're articulating. It's not, it's not a word that I think came up in your, in your discussion. Is the, does the neo-indigenite resent? Is there any of this born out of, uh, out of uh, resisting resentment in any way? Because it seems there's a lot of kind of fault lines where there might be some of that in the, uh, the Russian-Israeli position. Yeah, there are, uh, and, but, I guess th this resentment is not in the place where it is supposed to be, supposed to be in the hyphenated literature, because there is very special relation between this uh, Russian literature uh, in Israel and Israel and the land of Israel. So this uh, resentment may be and perhaps in the way of uh, Mm, as an obstacle on the way of their seeking for a new mm, mysticism or new reality or revealing the meaning of new symbols uh, that uh, they um, reveal around them in Israel. 
I think that most of resentment will be the cultural resentment, the original resentment uh, uh, that in, in this process, in the process of recognizing the cultural reality um, around them um, and on their way towards uh, the new indigeneity. Uh, of course, there are other resentments uh, of uh, immigrants or, or migrants, uh, but it is the more the theme, yeah, the motives, the more topics, yeah, of uh, the works. It, this is not the original resentment. This is not the resentment that constitutes the poetics or the uh, um, ideology or the world of the ideas, yeah. Uh, something else. This is uh, like uh, the uh, very popular theme in migrant literature, and it uh, indeed represents uh, them as immigrants. But this is not the migrant literature by nature, by essence, uh, from my opinion. Most of it. Now, uh, again, you can't uh, generalize it too much. Yeah, there are so many different. Um, tendencies here. There is also immigrant literature, but um, I can say the best examples of uh, Russian Israeli literature is not the migrant literature by definition, yeah, as sociological effect. Okay, we're a uh, little bit running a little bit late, so unless there are some quick questions which uh, I will take, then uh, maybe we will uh, finish this session and uh, it's not uh, my business to say the conference is closed. But I will just uh, pass uh, the word to Roma now and then we have uh, uh, the All meeting. right, I can use this opportunity. So, uh, all right, we're closing this session and uh, I want to close this conference um, and uh, to say you thank you very much. It was an amazing conference and um, thank you. Thanks to all the uh, people who helped, assisted in this or another way and to Adam, Ian and Richard especially, especially and uh, to all the board Thanks for the assistance in this process, and uh, thanks to all who take part in it, um, all the speakers of the conferences, all the, all the guests. So, unfortunately, we have to close the conference. Thank you. And now, uh, yeah, and now we're um, opening the a general assembly of the society of general genitive anthropology society um, those of you who want to stay can stay and take part in this uh, meeting yes Ian, am i right yes i'm wondering if we could take just a couple minute break um and uh, uh, yeah we'll and stop we'll stop, yeah we'll stop yeah. the recording and this opportunity, and we'll take five minutes of break, and we'll yep. be here for well, the. Well,